let's get right into it. Number 10. Why is the sky blue? This is the OG of kid questions. Every adult thinks they know the answer, but the second a 7-year-old stares at you with wide eyes and asks, Why is the sky blue? Your brain immediately freezes. You panic, mutter something about light scattering, and then immediately regret it because you sound like a broken science textbook. So here's the deal. The sky is technically blue because sunlight gets scattered by air molecules, and shorter wavelengths of light, like blue, scatter more than longer ones, like red. Great, problem solved, right? Nope, because then the kid asks, Okay, but why does it turn pink at sunset? Or worse, if space is black, why doesn't the sky just look like that all the time? Congratulations, you've been outwitted by someone who still eats glue sticks. The actual science is messier than the neat answers we memorize. Yes, Rayleigh scattering makes blue dominate during the day. But the exact shades of blue, pink, orange, and purple depend on dust particles, water vapor, air pollution, and even volcanoes thousands of miles away. The same sky can look slightly different depending on which hemisphere you're in, what season it is, or if some giant wildfire decided to spice up the atmosphere. And here's the kicker. Even if you know the physics, you still can't explain why we perceive those colors the way we do. Human eyes are weird little cameras that sometimes oversaturate, sometimes undersaturate, and sometimes invent colors our brain thinks should exist. Basically, your brain is an Instagram filter you never asked for. So when a kid asks why the sky is blue, you can either give them a half-truth about sunlight and air, or admit the reality, the sky is blue because our eyes are tricked into thinking it is. Also, please don't ask me why it's not green. I have a headache. Ta. Number 9. Why do we dream? Okay, picture this. You close your eyes at night and suddenly you're sprinting through a Walmart parking lot, being chased by a giant duck wearing a cowboy hat. You wake up sweaty, confused, and very aware you've eaten too much cheese before bed. And the real mystery is, why? Scientists have been trying to answer this for centuries, and the best explanation we have is a giant shrug emoji. Dreams might be your brain cleaning house, like when your computer does a random update at 3am without asking. Or maybe they're just your neurons firing off nonsense, and your brain, desperate for a plot, slaps together a B-grade movie starring your ex, your dentist, and three raccoons in a trench coat. Freud famously said dreams are about repressed desires, but if that's true, then a lot of us secretly want to be late for high school algebra, despite being 32 with lower back pain. Other scientists think dreams help us process emotions, practice survival skills, or even prepare for social interactions. That sounds smart, but it doesn't explain why half the population has dreamed of their teeth falling out. Unless evolution was really worried about orthodontics. And here's where kids win again. Why do we dream? Is one of those questions where every adult thinks they'll sound profound answering it, until you realize the honest answer is, we don't know. Your brain just likes to make weird short films while you're unconscious. Sorry. Basically, dreams are a nightly improv comedy show your brain puts on for itself. Sometimes it's terrifying, sometimes it's hilarious, and sometimes you wake up thinking, I'm never telling anyone about that one. Number 8. Why do we yawn? You're sitting in class, fighting the gravitational pull of boredom, and your mouth suddenly stretches into a yawn so big it could dislocate your jaw. The teacher notices, calls you out, and you panic yawn again, which makes half the class yawn, which starts a chain reaction of contagious yawns. And to this day, nobody knows why. One theory says yawning helps cool your brain, like opening a window when your laptop sounds like a jet engine. Another theory says it's about oxygen intake, except studies have shown yawning doesn't actually help with that. The contagious part? Some scientists claim it's an empathy thing, like your brain saying, I see your exhaustion and I raise you my own. But then dogs, chimps, and even parakeets yawn contagiously too, so either they're all emotional geniuses or yawns are just universal Wi-Fi signals we can't explain. And try explaining that to a kid. We yawn because our brains get hot. So why do babies yawn? Their brains are tiny. Okay, we yawn because it's contagious. But why do we catch it? Uh, friendship? The truth is yawning sits in this awkward gray zone of science where we've studied it forever, but it's still as mysterious as that one neighbor who mows the lawn at 10 p.m. It's involuntary, it's weirdly social, and it makes you feel like a fish out of water every time it happens in public. So the next time a kid asks why people yawn, feel free to say, because scientists don't know. Now stop making me do it. I'm starting to look suspicious. Number 7. Why is the ocean salty? This feels like an easy one. You're standing on the beach, waves crashing, salty breeze in your face and a kid tugs on your sleeve. Why is the ocean salty? You take a deep breath, ready to drop some science, and then realize you don't actually know. Because it just is, isn't gonna cut it with someone whose main hobby is asking why 50 times in a row. The basic explanation sounds simple. Rainwater erodes rocks on land, the rivers carry dissolved minerals to the sea, and over millions of years, those minerals, mainly sodium and chloride, build up to make seawater salty. Boom. Nailed it. Except if that's the whole story, then why aren't lakes equally salty? 
Why do some lakes stay fresh? Why isn't every puddle on the planet a mini saltwater lagoon? Suddenly you realize you've been tricked into a geology pop quiz by someone who still thinks crayons are a food group. Scientists know erosion plays a role, but the balance is messy. Oceans aren't just giant bowls of soup collecting salt, they're also constantly recycling it. Some minerals sink to the seafloor, others get trapped in living organisms, and still more get spit out by undersea volcanoes. The exact recipe of ocean saltiness has been stable for millions of years, but we can't fully explain why it doesn't just keep changing. It's like the planet has its own invisible salt accountant keeping the books balanced, and no one's figured out who's doing the math. So yeah, when a kid asks, why is the ocean salty, you can either hit them with the erosion speech, or just admit the truth, Earth is running the longest cooking experiment in history, and the broth came out salty, deal with it. Number 6, why do we hiccup? Few things are more annoying than hiccups, you're trying to give a serious presentation, and suddenly you sound like a malfunctioning squeaky toy, and of course, kids want to know why. The short version is, hiccups are spasms in your diaphragm, the muscle under your lungs, that cause your vocal cords to snap shut, making that high T sound. The longer version is, no one knows why humans even have this useless reflex in the first place. Some scientists think hiccups are just an evolutionary leftover, like your appendix or your uncle's mullet. In fact, baby embryos hiccup in the womb, possibly to practice breathing, which is cute, but also means you've been doomed to random body glitches since before birth. And then there's the mystery of cures. Hold your breath, drink water upside down, get scared by someone jumping out of a closet, Eat a spoonful of peanut butter. Everyone swears by their personal remedy, but none of them work consistently. It's like the placebo Olympics. Here's a fun fact that makes hiccups even weirder. Amphibians use a similar spasm reflex when they gulp water and air. So some scientists think hiccups are an evolutionary hand-me-down from our fishy ancestors. Basically, your diaphragm is still living in the past. Going, remember when we had gills? Good times. So if a kid asks, why do we hiccup, the most honest answer is, because our bodies are buggy software that hasn't been patched since the amphibian era, and now you sound like a cartoon character with bad timing. Number 5. Why do cats purr? You'd think this one would be easy. Cats purr because they're happy, right? Wrong. Cats are chaos embodied, and science has been humbled trying to figure them out. Yes, cats purr when they're content, but they also purr when they're injured, anxious, or even giving birth. Basically. Cats use purring for everything from, I love you, to, I'm dying. Imagine if humans just hummed at a steady vibration whenever anything happened. Just got a raise? Hmm. Lost my wallet? Hmm. Trapped under a car? Hmm. Not very helpful. The really wild part is the potential healing factor. Cat purrs vibrate at frequencies between 25 and 150 hertz, which, fun fact, are the same frequencies known to promote bone healing and tissue regeneration in humans. Some researchers think cats may literally be self-medicating with purr therapy. Others say it's just a way to manipulate humans into giving them food and attention. Honestly, both theories feel correct. But here's the kicker. We still don't know exactly how cats produce the purr. Unlike meowing, it's not tied to vocal cords in the usual way. It seems to be some special neurological trick cats evolved that no one fully understands. So the next time a kid asks, why do cats purr? You can either say, because they're happy, or be accurate and say, no one knows but possibly because they're tiny, vibrating wizards who control our lives. Number 4. Why do we have fingerprints? Your fingers look like someone doodled spirals on them with a sharpie. Great for unlocking your phone. Terrible if you're trying to get away with a crime. But if a kid asks you why humans even have fingerprints, well, prepare to disappoint them. The classic theory says fingerprints improve grip, like tire treads on a car. Makes sense, right? Except scientists tested it, and turns out fingerprints actually reduce friction on flat surfaces, which means your fingertips are basically sabotaging you every time you try to open a pickle jar. Thanks, evolution. Another idea is that fingerprints help with tactile sensitivity. The ridges amplify vibrations when you touch something, kind of like tiny antennas letting your brain pick up texture signals. That sounds smart and sciencey, but again, no one has proven it fully. Some researchers even think fingerprints might have evolved purely because of skin growth patterns, like stretch marks that just... stuck. So yeah, your unique identifier that CSI builds entire careers around might just be nature's doodles. And let's not forget the most absurd part. Every single human has different fingerprints. Identical twins? Different fingerprints. Clones in sci-fi movies? Still different fingerprints. Why? Nobody knows. Apparently evolution decided. Everyone gets their own custom barcode and never told us why it mattered. So when a kid asks, why do we have fingerprints? You can go with the sciency grip explanation, or you can be brutally honest. We don't know. Maybe it's for holding stuff, maybe it's for feeling stuff, or maybe evolution was just bored and wanted everyone to have swirly finger tattoos. Number 3. Why do onions make us cry? 
You're chopping onions, minding your business, and suddenly it looks like you've just watched the ending of a Pixar movie. Tears streaming, eyes burning, your family wondering who broke your heart in the kitchen. Naturally, a kid is going to ask, why do onions make you cry? And here's the fun part. Scientists kinda know, but not fully. Onions release chemicals when their cells are damaged. One of those chemicals, called lacrimatory factor, yes, that's its actual name, it sounds like a Hogwarts spell, travels into your eyes and mixes with water to form a mild acid. Your brain freaks out, your tear glands go into overdrive and boom, you're crying over vegetables. But here's the mystery. Why did onions evolve this ridiculous defense system? Animals aren't lining up to eat raw onions. Even humans don't exactly crave them unless we cook them into something delicious. Some scientists think it's just a leftover plant defense gone rogue, while others argue onions never intended to weaponize our eyeballs. It's just a side effect of their weird biochemistry. And here's where it gets sillier. Not everyone cries the same amount. Some people barely tear up, while others turn into Niagara Falls. Genetics. Eye sensitivity, kitchen ventilation, no one knows all the variables. You can buy tearless onions that were engineered to skip the crying chemical, but of course they taste worse, proving once again that science solves problems by ruining snacks. So when a kid asks, why do onions make us cry, the most honest answer is, because onions are chemical pranksters, and because nature has a twisted sense of humor. Number 2. Why do we laugh? Think about it. You're watching your friend trip over nothing and faceplant, and suddenly you're gasping for air like you just ran a marathon. Laughter is universal. Every culture does it, but no one can fully explain why. Some scientists argue laughter is just social glue, bonding us together like duct tape. When you laugh, you're signaling to others that something's safe, friendly, or just plain ridiculous. Babies laugh before they can talk, which suggests it's hardwired into us. But here's the problem. Why does your body need to wheeze uncontrollably and sound like a dying goose just to communicate joy? Others think laughter evolved as a kind of stress release, the body's way of saying, hey relax, no tiger is about to eat us. But then you remember people also laugh nervously in super awkward situations, like funerals. Yes, that's a thing, try explaining that to a kid. And let's not ignore the weirdest part. Laughter is contagious. Hearing someone else laugh, even if you don't know the joke, can trigger you too. It's basically a biological laugh track. Scientists suspect it's linked to empathy and mirror neurons, but again, no one fully knows. So the next time a kid asks, why do we laugh? You could launch into theories about bonding and stress relief. Or you could be real and say, because our brains are broken enough to think banana costumes are comedy gold, and honestly, that's beautiful. Number 1. Where do thoughts come from? This is the kind of question that makes adults stare at the floor for 5 minutes, pretending to think deeply, when really they're just panicking. A kid asks you, where do thoughts come from? And suddenly you realize you've been walking around your whole life with a brain you don't actually understand. The default adult answer is, from your brain, which is technically true, but also useless. That's like saying a cake comes from the oven. Okay, but how? What scientists know is that thoughts are the result of electrical signals, and chemical reactions bouncing between about 86 billion neurons in your head. Those neurons form connections, pass messages, and, poof, you have an idea. But what no one can explain is how those chemical zaps turn into things like memories, imagination, and the sudden urge to Google, do pigeons have knees, at 3 a.m.? Philosophers have been wrestling with this forever. Is a thought just biology doing its thing, or is there some mysterious mind separate from the physical brain? Neuroscientists can track brain activity during thinking, but they can't fully explain the leap from firing neurons to actual lived experience. It's like watching sparks in a computer and trying to guess what website is loading. And then there's the really unsettling part. A lot of your thoughts aren't even yours. They pop into your head randomly, like unwanted notifications. Ever had a disturbing or embarrassing thought that makes you go, whoa, brain chill? Yeah, nobody knows why that happens either. The brain just freelances intrusive nonsense whenever it feels like it. So when a kid asks where thoughts come from, the most accurate answer is, from your brain, kind of, but also from nowhere. It's complicated. Please don't ask follow-up questions unless you want me to spiral into an existential crisis.